everyone hits a bump in the road. What do you do with it? Be inspired as we explore the ways people experience, navigate, and manage the ups and downs and twists and turns in this road trip called life. Welcome to another episode of Bump in the Road. The basic podcast is always free. We also have a premium subscription called Bump 2 that lets you listen in on extended behind-the-scenes conversations with our guests. Check it out at www.bumpintheroad.us. Sean Hayes is a wise man, but his wisdom's hard-earned. Sean was driven from an early age to make money. Banking was the perfect outlet, and he built a banking empire and took it public. But one decision, a decision not to toe the line, but to step over it, would lead to the unraveling of all that he had built. This is a terrific discussion of drive, ambition, fear, and greed, losing it all to find it all. Sean is the author of The Great Choice, Lessons on My Journey from Big Time Banking to the Big House and Back. Please welcome Sean to Bump in the Road. Sean, welcome to Bump in the Road. If you would, tell us your story. Well, uh, one, thank you for having me, and I enjoy your podcast. And two, um, I guess I would say I've had one of the most interesting lives that someone could have, and I, I like to start off with there's a saying in life that seldom do people realize their greatest dreams or worst fears. And I've been fortunate enough that I have exceeded my greatest dreams, and I was a dreamer, and I've almost recognized my worst fear, and um, and the only thing that worse could have happened to me would have been the loss of a child. So I, I've ex- experienced both ends. Uh, I grew up in, in, a, in a small town in southern Missouri, and um, two entrepreneurial parents um, of the World War II vintage, and um, when I was growing up, they really didn't give me much guidance other than uh, go to college. And when I got ready to get out of college, they said, you can be anything you want to be, but a banker. And uh, I was not rebellious, but I chose that industry out of guidance. And uh, they were very disappointed because in small business, your only two governors are your bank and the IRS. But um, I went into banking at a time when it was changing, when sales had come into an industry that had been one of order taking, and it was a ton of fun. And um, I uh, at seven at seven years in, and at twenty nine years old, I woke up and I figured out my last name wasn't Kemper. And at that point, every CEO in the last um, at that time seventy four years had last name had been Kemper, and uh, now then for one hundred and twelve years, every CEO's last name has been Kemper. So um, myself and another man bought a bank, and that's a story in itself because buying a bank really is no different than buying any other kind of company other than it's regulated and there are certain kind of requirements that you have to meet. And um, we were off and running. Now, what I didn't tell you was, and this is to me the best part of this story, is we are people who were in a um, um, 168-mile one-way-to-work trip. That's how far I drove. That should tell you my entrepreneurial commitment. And um, my funny story for your audience is this. We'd owned the bank for a few weeks, and it was in late October, and it was very dark in the Midwest. And we figured out we had $1,100,000 of cash in a bank. And uh, only 10 years later, I had 38 banks and maybe had 50000 in cash and more than that in the ATM. But uh, Fed funds, overnight money was about 9%. We figured out we could make an extra five or 6,000 a month. So uh, we said, let's take the money to the St. Louis Fed. I picked up the phone. I called Brinks as any person would. And literally, um, they said it's $250 and you're going to be there a week from Thursday. And I said, okay, I'll call you back. And I went down the hall and I said, Mike, let's load it in the trunk of my car. And seriously, we loaded three quarters of a million dollars in the trunk of my car on a dark night. It's not insured. It's 168 miles, about 120 of it on two lane highway. And I drove home with that money in my, in my trunk. And that was really a culture setter um, because costs were important to us and revenue was important. And we went on a ride. Um, I was, uh, we went public. Uh, We had um, a 15 year run that was unbelievable. 
we grew the bank uh, 80 fold in um, in nine years, which is unheard of in the banking industry. And um, then we we got bought. And uh, this is where my story starts going a different way. And um, I spent four years with a Fortune 200 with the seventh largest bank in America. And as I say, I lost touch with uh, reality of uh, I was a guerrilla warrior, um, you know, where I was involved in everything. And all of a sudden I'm at a 30,000 foot level every day for four years. And I lost touch with markets and with peoples and, and people that I dealt with and what was happening. And uh, I'd invested a lot of money in more banks and owned a lot of bank stocks and had always been an investor in real estate. And a little thing called 2008 came along and uh, I was losing millions of dollars a month. Um, and all of a sudden, I um, saw an opportunity, uh, completely legal, um, to make some money. And I believe most decisions are driven by greed and fear or a combination thereof. And mine would have been both. And uh, at the 11th hour, um, to get the deal done, I committed a crime. And I knew when I did it, it was a crime. And uh, not like when you rob a 7-Eleven, when you know, they call the police right then, it, uh, it was seven years before I was indicted. And uh, so it's been an interesting ride. That's the, that's the beginning and the end, and there's a lot in between. But let's, I'll let you take me where you want to go from here. Boy, sitting on that for seven years, that must have really eaten away at you. It did. And the only reason why I, one, committed the crime and two, could sleep at night with, to some degree was I didn't steal any money. All I did this for, and the irony is this, I did it because it bought me time. What I didn't realize, it only bought me about 11 months because I believed um, that over time I would work myself out of my problems, but uh, it didn't happen. I got there though, and this is why I called the book The Gray Choice. Um, if you leave Los Angeles and you uh, are headed for Washington, D.C. in a commercial airliner, given the amount of distance you're going, the amount of time it takes to travel it, if you're off by one degree, you end up in New York City. And what happened to me is, is something that many of us face, really, I believe all of us face, is we don't live in a world that's 50% black and 50% white. We live in a world that's somewhat white and somewhat black, and it's a lot of degrees of gray. And uh, my first few weeks in the banking business, they had an aptitude test, and um, we all went in there, and uh, I was on the front row, and we were starting to take the test, and the proctor looked down and tapped on the table and said, excuse me, I noticed that the young man in front of me has answered the first question, no, and um, you all need to erase your answer if it's a no and answer it yes. And the question was, have you stolen anything from this company? Well, in three or four weeks, obviously I hadn't. So I immediately questioned why I had to answer yes. And he looked at me and he said, son, at some point you will. You'll take home a, a legal pad, you'll take home a pen, and you'll do it. And that's how life begins. You make a choice to do one thing, and then you slowly over time, and, and we developed a culture, and I talked a little bit about the culture when I told you about the money that we threw in the trunk of my car, um, to, to save $250, um, is uh, I would go to uh, the largest law firm in the state of Missouri, who was my counsel, and I would say, don't ever tell me I can't do something. Tell me how I legally can, and then I'll decide if it's worth the aggravation. And I told that story to a friend of mine in Chicago a few weeks ago, and I said, literally from my office, you would just get on I-55 and go straight to Chicago. But if you told me I couldn't do that, and you said I had to take a bus to Kansas City, I had to hitchhike to Omaha, I had to take a train to Des Moines, and I had to fly in a bi bi biplane to Chicago, then I might say the aggravation isn't worth it. But when you have a culture that's about pushing the envelope, and over you go a long period of time, you, you cross lines. And what I did was I went from what you'll call light gray to dark gray, and then I crossed the line and committed a crime. And, and what I talk to people about frequently now is I don't want anyone to experience the lows that I've experienced. I hope they all experience the highs. But I got myself into this. And as I said to you before we started, 
there isn't one thing I would change because if I change one thing, I'd change everything. And I have five children who I dearly love. And I've, I've traveled the world and I've met princes, prime ministers, presidents, politicians, you know, billionaires, all kinds of people that had I not taken the first step, I would have never gotten there. Do I wish I hadn't have done what I did? Absolutely. But now then I'm, a, I'm certainly a better person. And my mission is, is to help others not, uh, not do that. What exactly did you do? Well, in banking, law is, in reality, you can't do business with yourself. Uh, you can in, in very thin, arrow, narrow patches. In fact, there's an article in the Wall Street Journal about how some of the Middle Eastern banks are uh, have crossed that line because they don't quite have the regulation we do in this country. But I own 54% of a bank, and so that virtually prohibits you from doing anything except writing a check out of a checking account. And um, we were buying a, a large group of loans that were non-performing um, from several banks. And I was in a real estate partnership with one of the parties in a performing loan. But in order for that bank to sell the chunk of loans that where the real profit was, they required us to buy the performing loan. That is a crime. I I, they would, I, I unjustly enrich myself. That is bank fraud. And um, um, that's what happened. And had the transaction worked, and I'd done this, not, not with myself ever being involved, but probably 100 or more times in the previous 15 or 20 years, had it gone like it normally would have, um, it would have just came, came and went. But of course, um, it didn't. And, uh, and I shouldn't have done it. You know, I'm going to go back to a little bit, uh, go back to the shades of gray, because that really resonates with me. Uh, you were saying that you spoke with a lawyer, and part of the entrepreneurial spirit of building something is finding a way to make things happen. And you use the example of going to Chicago and having to take um, some side trips and things. But I think that's reality in business. And actually, I went to a, a fairly prestigious business school, and one of the lasting pieces of, I don't want to call it wisdom, but information I took away from that education was there is always a way, just find it. And yeah, that and, attitude, and that's true. yeah, and that attitude wasn't meant to cross the line, but in reality, it does, at some point, it does cross the line if you're that driven to get your results. And I don't think that that's unusual in business circles. No, it isn't. In fact, there's a book out there that written by an attorney who says that virtually every business person in America commits three felonies a day. I don't know if it's three, but it's pretty easy to commit one when you really get to the sum and substance of the law. And uh, and I'm not dismissing mine, but I love what they taught you in business school because I'm, I don't wear Nike shoes because I just don't wear a lot of tennis shoes. But I love what a great line. Just do it. And that's what entrepreneurs do. They just do it. And um, and you find a way to do it. I was um, in a meeting uh, late last week and I said, your all's problem is you're getting ready to get ready. You're building an arsenal where an entrepreneur just does it and then you figure it out. And lots of times when you just do it, you do things that are not, you know, unintentionally are not inappropriate or illegal, but they happen to be when you read the letter of the law. And uh, I have a chapter in a book called Pushing, Pushing, Pushing. And that's what I did and still do just in a different way now, because the lesson I learned and um, is I now think about my thinking. I believe um, most entrepreneurs are very quick thinkers. I'm a quick thinker, a quick study. And so now then I do spend an extra second or two thinking about my thinking so that I don't cross too far into the gray. But I, but I, I believe the world is very little white and very little black and a lot of gray in virtually every business because the margins in the gray. Absolutely. And the other thing too is um, I think entrepreneurs and business in general is rewarded for getting out of their comfort zone. At least that's the theory. If you stay in your comfort zone or wait for the perfect moment, it is never going to happen. And a lot of times that means pushing the edge, um, particularly in, in today's world. Uh, I think a lot of our Businesses and activities are way decades ahead of the law. How do you reconcile the two? Yeah, no, that's a tough one. I like to, uh, I learned this when I was in prison. There were three felonies uh, when the Constitution was written murder, 
counterfeiting and treason. There's now 42,000. <laughs> so, um, you know, it, what I did was wrong. I won't, I won't ever dismiss that. But had I been in, in Italy, I would have been fined. And um, instead, I spent 37 months incarcerated, uh, 17 of those. Most of the people that when I ultimately got to prison um, had never been handcuffed. I never went to court that I wasn't in shackles. And for 17 months, you had to worry about it at breakfast. But at lunch and dinner, you stood while you you ate so you could be prepared to flee or fight. Um, you know, it's not it's not what you think it is um, in, in the in the system. Now, once you get to a federal prison, it is, um, you know, far easier. It's a camp and it's a, a much different situation. But I spent 17 months in cells with cuffs and shackles and all kinds of things that uh, none of my peers had experienced. How did prison change you? Um, I, well, one, um, it teaches you who in life you're really, your friends are and who they aren't. Um, it taught me um, to think about my thinking. Um, and um, other than that, it only proved that the American entrepreneurial spirit is inside those walls and outside it. And that people are people everywhere because where I was, if you wanted, well, there were 200 and some men at the one prison and there were 400 and some cell phones. Um, if you wanted Kentucky fried chicken, McDonald's, Wendy's, Taco Bell, you could have it. If you wanted, if you wanted vodka, it was what kind, not could you get it. If you wanted a beer, did you want it in a bottle or a can? So uh, entrepreneurism uh, crosses all lines and through fences. Talk a little bit about your lows. Obviously, prison was part of that. Yeah, I think what probably I changed it to, I used to always say, where's the low point? And for me, and it was interesting that, um, you know, you picked up very quickly on the, the seven years that it took. But I would say I had a low period that probably went two and a half years where it just didn't seem like there was a bottom from late 15 to probably the summer of, of 18, almost three years. And then at that point, I said, okay, I found a bottom. And then it was the beginning of the rise. Now, of course, if you would have asked me that in, you know, in December of 18, I would have said, well, I don't know that it's, it's rising, but it's better than it was a year ago. And it's gotten progressively better. You know, it's like I tell people, I always, in, in business so many times people say, you know, they were, they don't worry about their customer, which is what they should worry about. They focus on their competitor, which I believe they shouldn't. And they're always thinking their competitor is going to go out of business or they're going to stumble. And I'm like, you can't worry about that. And it's the same thing whenever you're trying to figure yourself out of a hole, you know, don't worry about it. Just keep going forward. How do you eat an elephant one bite at a time? Just keep eating that bite and taking a step forward and you get there. It also taught me this, and um, I love, by the way, that you mentioned results earlier, because on the back of every notepad I had for 20 years, I wrote results. And I would say that's all I care about when you come into my office. But the second thing is I redefined failure in my own mind. And uh, to me, I had failed. What I came to realize is the true definition of failure. And obviously, this isn't mine, but it's the right one is it's not failure until you quit. And we all have missteps. Uh, issues, problems. But as long as we keep going forward, we're not a failure. We're a failure when we quit. I think that's so true. Um, I think that putting energy into any situation at some point will change the situation. You don't know how much energy, you don't know how long. And that's where just simply being per persevering comes in. Yeah, I would, people tell me my, you know, one, they go, we just can't believe you still go. And especially at the pace you go, you're the most resilient or you have tremendous perseverance. And I think those are traits that entrepreneurs and business people have and uh, that make them successful. And I just had such a consistent meteoric rise that the fear of failure in the, in the, in the, in the 2008, nine range just really ate me. And that was where my error came in. And, and, and what also happened to me, and I, and I really speak a lot about this when I talk to, to people like yourself and your audience, I had a man and three women that I met with, you know, two to five or six times a week, um, a month when I was, when I was building my company. 
And after 15 years, when we sold one, everybody was 20 to 40 years older than I was. And two, we were all tired of each other. Three, we went our own ways. And I lost that cohesive group of people who I could ask anything to, who would tell me exactly what they thought, who helped me accountable, and who you couldn't BS. And I I, I read everyone say, you know, you're only as smart as the five people you're closest to. You're only as rich and all those things. But there's a lot to be said for having four or five people who really hold you accountable and uh, in a way that a partner, a spouse, or a significant other can't. But you need those tough people around you. And um, and that was something that when I lost it and then when times got hard, that caused me to um, to make a mistake that, that I wouldn't have made years before because they would have helped me to such a level of accountability that um, I would not have done it. And I, I encourage people, build a circle of people around you that are hard on you. You know, that's really interesting because businesses evolve, particularly over 10 or 20 years, and people evolve over 10 or 20 years. And that's not something you can anticipate at the beginning. And it happens so slowly. Can you really see it when you're in the middle of it? No, you don't. And that's, it's like, it's like anything in life. You don't, you don't see it or you don't appreciate it or you don't understand it till sometimes after it's passed. And, uh, but to me, the little things are having those group of people. The other thing is um, I'd been fortunate and this, this was not the, the story when I bought my second bank in 1990, but I literally, the day we closed, added women and minorities to the board. And I'm a huge believer in diversity because I've never seen color. I only see green <laughs> as an entrepreneur. And when you add people, I, I this when I mentioned the four people, one of them was a woman, and I put her on the board immediately. But I could, she um, would interview people for me. Um, it was one of the roles she had on the board, and she was a tough person. And she'd come in and she would say, Sean, you're going to love Janice. You're going to love her. But these two things you're not going to like. And guess what? You can't change them. So I challenge you to change how you look at those two things in her. And when I had someone teach me that, I had results from people that, um, you know, my, my top people, um, uh, the top um, eight people around me, three of them were women, which in the in the 90s and early 2000s was not the norm in senior management. And the same for the men. They were things that drove me crazy about them. But having someone teach me to look at it from me changing and not them really made us successful. And we did so many things. We were, we were on the cutting edge of technology. Not that we were technology people, but my technology person wasn't a banker. And in those days, most of the competition had, um, the IT people are still calling, um, most of my competition had huge investments in mainframe systems. And I didn't have that. And we used off the shelf, very low cost technology to move the needle. And we did things that in those days, people thought you all are crazy, but that was part of pushing the envelope. It was not doing things because that's the way we'd always done them. And with the four people I mentioned, none of them had any experience in banking. And so if you said, if they said, why do we do this, Sean? And I said, it's because it's the way we've always done it. That almost always meant we were going to change it. <laughs> you know, you talk about pushing the envelope and you were really pushing the envelope at that point in time, having women on your board, women and minorities. But what yeah. really... um what really intrigues me is how you chose to change in order to get the most out of your people. That's really profound. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I credit Virginia Kirkpatrick with this. And if she were alive, um, you certainly want to talk to her because her experience was unbelievable. But it took someone with that kind of knowledge to say, do you want to be better? And and I, I was taught, and, and you'll know this because I know you've worked with people. Um, when I was very early on as a management trainee, I reported to a vice chairman who I could, he would take the time to sit down and ask me questions and he could turn me 180 degrees in direction only by asking questions. His peer that many of my, many of my peers I reported to would just say, you don't get it. It's my way or the highway. 
And when you have that culture of letting people teach you, and that's what Virginia did, she taught me. And she taught me very early on. I, the first thing she really taught me was we bought my partner out, as I mentioned in the book, because he was nine years older and and uh, he retired as soon as we bought the second bank. And um, so he came in and we worked out a financial arrangement. And he said, I want to do this project for you. And I went to Virginia and she said, John, she said, you did a really good job of determining this relationship. The, you know, the, the team's good. The board's with you. And you did it financially within the parameters you said you would. But you're kidding yourself if this individual is going to do what he told you he was going to do. Not only did he not do it, but um, he put 25,000 miles on his company car in three months that we let him use it. And that right then taught me that at that point, I thought I knew a lot because I was had just turned 30. And that's when I figured out that um, in life, uh, as Mark Twain said, uh, my father was the dumbest man in the world. And two years later, he'd learned a lot. Well, <laughs> I learned a lot. And, and, and I don't think the age is relevant. It's a time in your life when you do that. So once I had that experience with her, then I just was nothing but, you know, that sponge of teach me. And that's what she taught me. And I believe that's what good, good management does is they don't try to change their people. They try to adapt to them. And I think you have to, because there's, you know, there's people are hard. Good people are hard to get, especially today. Good people don't change jobs. Good people perform Give them the rope and let them run. You know, you talked a little bit about being on the cutting edge of technology. And today's cutting edge of technology involves artificial intelligence. How do you think that's going to, do you have any sense of how that might change banking? Uh, well, it's going to it change, to me, it's going to totally change our world. And, um, and I think that um, we're all going to adopt it. We all are adopting it. Uh, for me, the sad part is, um, and I mentioned this in the book, in my day in banking, a bank was a hub of activity and there was human interaction. And, uh, and today it's Chick-fil-A, McDonald's, you know, it's, it's kiosk ordering, it's an app. Um, I, I was on the phone with Amazon earlier this morning and after uh, my uh, desktop, my laptop, my phone, trying their AI, I finally asked for a person. And um, so I, I think that's it. My negative, the only negative I have, and then I have to tell you my funny personal experience with AI, is um, I really feel for the undereducated in our society because AI is going to continue, and robots and things are going to continue to take more manual and low-end jobs. And we have to focus, especially those of us in business, have to focus on training our people and bringing the people at the bottom of the heap up. Because, yeah, it's going to save money. But at the end of the day, uh, business and life's about people. And uh, I'm, a, I'm a huge people person. I believe that's where it is. I believe that at the end of the day, people do business with people. But I will digress and tell you, I love AI. And uh, my social media people uh, a few uh, months ago came up and, and they asked uh, Chet GPT about um, uh, quotes of wisdom by, uh, by Sean Hayes for, <laughs> for my social media stuff. And by the way, I, I have a lot of children that would question even that sentence, <laughs> but um, um, it came back and, and I screenshotted this and my oldest son and I laughed. I said, Stephen, um, these quotes are so good. I wish I'd said them, but it came back and said, there aren't any out there, but having um, read or scanned or whatever they said with my book, these are things he might've said. And it was very powerful. I also watched a woman who knew nothing about an industry write a business plan in less than an hour with Chad GPT, send it to the management, and they would have thought she spent a week at it. So I think it's a very powerful tool. And um, and I think we'll figure it out. I just, like I said, it's a disintermediation that'll happen in the coming years for a period of time, because anytime technology changes, a lot of people get uh, get hurt. You know, I think that as we become more technologically um, immersed as a society, I think there's a human hankering for more one-on-one -on -one human connection. Is there an opportunity I hope in there that? Is. Yeah, I think there's a lot of it. I in every business I'm involved in today, I tell people I'll hop on a plane, I'll get in the car, I'll walk down the street. I want to look people in the eye because at the end of the day, people do business with people, and I have a real generational challenge. 
Um, and and I, my oldest son's 35. And I told him several years ago, I said, Stephen, the world's not ending. It's not horrible. It's just different. I'm not a naysayer. I, I'm very, very, very encouraged by a lot of things I see in, in young people. What I'm not encouraged by is how they hide behind. They used people hid behind email. Now they hide behind texts and things like that. And there's a point um, quite often in every situation where you have to do one on one, where you have to look someone in the eye, because in a text, uh, you know, it's really unless someone says something, it's kind of hard to judge their temperature where you're in a room with them, as you and I know, you know, if they cross their arms, well, you know, there's a barrier up. And if they're smiling and leaning towards you, you're making progress and all those kind of things were taught. That's an art that um, I believe um, it, there's a place for in today's society and in, in, in business um, for the rest of eternity, because people do business with people at the end of the day in a whole lot of situations. You know, a slight side, um, side trip here, but um, I want to read you something from your book. It's about control. And I find that topic of control to be really fascinating. You wrote, I spent my whole life thinking I was in control, but I wasn't in control of anything anymore. All I really had control over was the type of alcohol in my glass. I shifted from Cabernet to vodka. Yep. Oh, because it was That's cheap and good. easy. Sorry. Yeah. But it's not the, the Cabernet to vodka piece that I'm really curious about. It's the idea of control. Um, how do you see control and how has it ruled your life or how have you ruled it? Well, it ruled me for a very long time. I was so controlling that in, in, um, and I only went to restaurants that took reservations because I didn't like to wait. And in any restaurant or club I went to, they knew what table to seat me at. And I was in, and when we would have meetings, I controlled if I knew how many people were coming, if there were three of them, I never had more than three of my people. And I had, I wanted people seated. We scripted meetings before um, and things like that. I think planning is good. Controlling doesn't work. I thought I was in control of everything. As I said, and I was sincere in saying that what I learned through my bump in the road was I really didn't control anything. And so now then the lesson from that is I don't try to control. I only control you know, just exactly what's, Psychology says I only control myself and my own thoughts and my own actions because that's all I can. But because I've been down that path of trying to control everything, I actually like the results better now because I'm not walking a tightrope every day of my life thinking, how do I keep control of all these things? And, um, and that's a good thing. It's a far more productive thing. And it allows you to be more present and um, reactive in a good way to whatever happens in the course of a conversation or a situation. Absolutely, no. It's it's the only way to live. But you know, you you when you when you're after power and money, uh, you think the only way you can get there is is through control, and that's that's not the case. But you but you as you succeed, you only reinforce the wrong thing, and that's what I did for a very long time. Yeah, control is something I have really wrestled with. Um, I tell a story in my book about um, two very well-known pilots that spun their plane in, hit the ground at 200 miles an hour. Obviously, everybody died. And um, essentially, they exceeded the, v the do not exceed um, speed of their plane, and they ripped the wings off. It was obviously an upsetting situation, but it lingered for years with me. And it took me years to figure out what was it that really bothered me about this accident. And what I realized was it challenged my sense of control. If these two pilots who are world-renowned, who are really terrific pilots, could inadvertently enter a spin, rip the wings off their plane, and die, what was I doing? Wow, that's deep. I can see why it took you a long time to get there. That's... that's uh... But that's life. You know, we control is is um, something that when you when you don't really realize that you're not in control, you spend hours and hours and hours consumed with trying to control things. And uh, I have a friend who went through a similar thing that I did. And we talk frequently and I tell him, well, he goes, why are you so happy? 
And I said, Richard, because I know I'm not in control (laughs) and you still want to be in control. And until you can give that up and just and just live the best you can, make the best decisions you can and trust that at the end. And I believe this is the case in the end, those things get the right result. You're going to be miserable. And he's a pretty unhappy man the last several years. Trust is a really profound concept, too. Yes. Yeah, it is. It's a thing you learn about misplacing trust. I think going down this journey um, taught me a lot more about people. Uh, I used to say this. I'm, I'm a very boring person. I'm a finance undergraduate and a finance graduate. And I said about 20 years ago, even before I had problems, I should have been a psychology undergraduate and a finance graduate because really <laughs> business and life are understanding people. That's and, the success. And as you alluded to, actually ultimately understanding yourself. Yes. And that it, and I will tell you this, and, and you've written a book, but in my case, I wrote the book because uh, a woman told me you're a really good speaker and you ought to do speaking, but you have to have a book. And I told her at that time, I said, Gail, I'm not that interesting. And then after you spend 37 months in prison and literally I read about a book a day, um, I came back and said, I'm still not that interesting, but I'm as interesting as most of these people. (laughs) But what came out of the book was this, and I didn't ever think this would, excuse me, be it. Um, I had a, a, a white gentleman I've known for decades and an African-American man I've known for three years, both independently, and they certainly don't know each other because uh, they're in different parts of the country, call me up after they read my book and they said, Sean, do you not feel free? And you said it a moment ago, after I had written this, I felt like I really knew myself and I was really comfortable with myself. And they hit the nail on my head I have felt unbelievably free since I've done it. And that's a whole nother comfort level. And that's, I guess, why control doesn't matter because I'm comfortable with Sean and I feel free. Is it a little scary putting your story out like that? You know, um, it is and it isn't. Um, It is because, um, you know, we all, uh, you know, we don't like to admit mistakes we've made. And I talk about some things in there. Uh, well, the, you know, this is a, a funny thing, but it's true. The story about the three quarters of a million dollars, mm-hmm. 10 people didn't know that story until I wrote the book. And, and I didn't tell the part where I slept. We, we put the money in the house and slept with it. My cousin, who hadn't heard of it, and I only have one cousin on my mother's side, his question was, Sean, why don't you pull it in the garage and sleep in the car in the garage? And, you know, truthfully, I didn't even think of that. But um, but no, it um, it. Uh, it is scary to put all those things out there and especially your failures. But then the other thing about um, gaining maturity and knowledge and, and comfort and is, is being able to, to talk about anything. And I had had 25 years of unbelievably positive press. And then I went through a period where I had about eight years of unbelievably negative press. And after that, where I didn't even comment for five or six years and the press was bad and they wrote the story however they want to. And when the government issues a press release, it's taken uh, verbatim. Um, you learn, you know what? It's OK to put it all out there because people have said things that are um, completely incorrect and at least mine are correct. I have to tell you in the book, um, it was amazing to me how the book company and the editors go into um, making sure that your facts are correct. And in the first chapter, I talked about my first day at work. And uh, when they began the edit, they sent me a picture of the building I went to work in and uh, who had designed it. And then I talked about an article that was written 33 years ago last summer in the Kansas City uh, Times. And they sent me the copy of the article that I read in the the book. And um, so, um, you know, it is uh, it's okay to put it all out there. If you could give some advice to your younger self, what would you say? You're going, it it is, you're going to live a lot longer than you think. And I don't mean that I didn't think I wouldn't live to 70 or 80, that in it, but there's a lot more time. It is a marathon, not a sprint. And um, I think that uh, you have to look at life as a marathon runner, 
and not as a sprinter. And that's what I would tell any young person, especially a young Sean Hayes. Thank you for listening. I hope you'll support this podcast by becoming a Bump2 subscriber. Buy us a cup of coffee. It's your support that makes this podcast and website possible. I hope you found something in today's podcast that inspires you along your own life's path, because sometimes a bump in the road is actually a portal into a more conscious and meaningful life.